Hey everybody, hope you're doing well out there. It is late Saturday night, and I can't think of a better time than right now than to talk about some board games and Legends of Andor. So, you know, I did post a initial impression about Legends of Andor. I was really excited with what I had just experienced, basically. The setup, the onboarding to this game, again, can't stress enough how impressed I am. I am a copywriter by trade, so efficiency in writing is really just a gigantic part about my job. Taking an article or some notes or something that is a thousand words, and how can I get it down to 200 words? That's a big part of what I do. And this game does that just throughout every bit of it. And I absolutely love it. I love the designer. Uh, the the courtesy he has for his players and you know he, he cares about our time and our effort he didn't want this to be a chore you know uh, sometimes board games can be a chore they can feel like a chore but this game rarely does um, it is ready to play uh, you don't have to paint minis I mentioned that uh, just just getting it onto the table and getting it going is great and even on the legends where you die, and you lose, and that will happen unless you are a genius. Even then, I don't think you're going to be able to beat this game uh, the first time, you know, these legends. But um, it's just uh, setting it up again and again, even after you lose, is so simple. It's amazing. So let's get past that. Um, you know, that, that is found throughout the game, not just when you first set it up, but also, you know, up to Legend 3, which I just completed. Again, it's introducing new components to the game, but it's telling me exactly how they fit in. So one thing I love about um, Legend 3 and some things I've noticed in this game is what I'll call controlled randomness. Um, so that's... Pro number one, we'll call it controlled randomness. What I mean by that and what I really enjoy, one of the things I really enjoy about games like this, adventure games or dungeon crawlers, is that controlled randomness where it doesn't teeter too far towards the controlled or fixed side, but not too random. So a couple examples. Sometimes too random for me Shadows of Brimstone, you start almost every mission in a mine, and then you have no idea what world you're about to go into. Um, while that's exciting and pretty cool, at times, it, it's, it's, I mean, it, let's, let's not get it twisted. It is, it is cool, but sometimes the narration can get lost in all that randomness. Some people love that. Some people might not. I think it's all right. It's cool you're going into different uh, areas and, and, and environments, but that's besides the point. So that's an example of a very random game and then a more fixed controlled game would be like um, uh, uh, Sword and Sorcery, um, perhaps, because it has a fixed map and whatever. This game is right smack dab in the middle for me. You have your fixed map you have, each of these legends has a, um, a narrative and a theme to it, usually a similar goal, even though your goals can change. But then it injects this randomness into it that seamlessly comes together with that controlled element to it. So the, the designer, you know, had this uh, story we, he wanted us to play out in Legend 3. But the way the monsters come out, the order in which they come out are going to be determined by these monster tokens. And then each of these heroes draw different fate cards, which is going to uh, each one of them have to accomplish their fate card for you to move on to the boss of this map. So great balance there for me. Again, you have that control. You're going to enjoy this story, um, this plot that the designer 
has created. But if you have to play this through three different times like I had, uh, it was different each time. Now, it was very clear. So that that's going to be positive number one. The controlled randomness, I think, it's really in a nice balance there. Let's go to a con. <clears throat> this is totally off the cuff, by the way. Moving into a con. This game is such a puzzle that that randomness part can misalign. Uh, the stars don't always align. Stars sometimes misalign. The, la the third time I played this, Legend 3, just a little bit ago, the stars align. I could tell right from the get-go the way the, the, the fake cards I got, the monster tokens, how it had them spawn out here, where the rune stones and the, the medical herbs or whatever they're called spawned randomly out here. I could tell, I could easily see the path to victory. There were other times where that was not the case. So I believe it was the previous attempt I had at this mission or legend where, <clears throat> again, I drew my fake cards, but that time two of my fake cards were and. Uh, for two different heroes, I had to find a farmer on the map and take that farmer to a spot on the map. So there are only three farmers. A random event killed one of those farmers. So dead farmer, only two farmers remaining that had to be used for a quest. Outside of that, what farmers are really for is you're supposed to collect them, take them back to the castle, and they give you an additional shield. If you're playing four heroes like I am, you only have one shield. So you really do need some of those farmers to add some more shields because a big, big, big part of this puzzle is to actually use those shields. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a troll coming through, he's tough to beat, you may as well just let him storm the castle remove one of those shields, and that is going to be a more efficient move for you than actually spending the time to kill him. Stars were misaligned in that mission because um, it's very clear that at times at least two monsters you want to just send through into the castle. Um, th there was no way I could win that one. Another quick example when the stars misaligned was at one point, a gore, whatever it is, grunt dude, spawned right next to the castle, and the next card I flipped over said, move the grunt one space forward, right into the castle, killed me. I had no way of knowing that that was about to happen. So, for as much as I like that controlled randomness, on the con side, I do think that there's situations that the randomness just, it really hurts your chance of winning. And it's the more you play this game, the more obvious it appears. It's almost like a game of solitaire, where if you play enough solitaire, you lay out your seven face-up cards in front of you, you know pretty quickly if this is going to be, you know, if it's going to end well or probably not. This game is very much like that, I think. So pro and a con. <clears throat> Back to the let's sit, let's do one more con real quick while it's on my mind, and this is a this is important to me. Um, it's it's a really fascinating I don't know thought about this game is again we're back to a puzzle. It's a timed puzzle. You have. So many resources, and your main resource is time. Each of your heroes per day get seven hours. Okay, so you get, I'm playing four heroes, I get 28 hours. That's, that's a lot of stuff I can do in one day. At the end of one of those days, some things happen, including you move the narrator up one on the tracker. Makes sense doesn't make sense. It makes sense 
in the design of the game and how how he wanted it to play out move to move does not make sense thematically that when you here's a con so I call what it is and I'm going to explain you know my understanding of why he did this but when you kill a monster the narrator goes up again so let's think about that real quick 28 hours all this stuff happens you're moving all over the place on the map narrator goes up one at the end of the day same exact thing happens narrator moves up when you kill one of these little peons it doesn't make sense I understand that this game, uh, as I've seen some discussion on Board Game Geek, and this part does make sense. The, the role of the narrator is, and the reason it's named a narrator, is because it is telling you this story, this legend that has already happened. So you're just playing out this legend that's already happened. That is super cool. I love that. So it does make sense that... Um, you can't just go out here and kill every monster on the board. Obviously, you can't do that mechanically because the narrator is going to fly off the table after you kill eight or ten monsters. Um, so you have to literally pick and choose your battles. And I understand that if you're watching a Lord of the Rings movie, which this game appears to be heavily inspired by, not every scene is them just killing orcs. They pick and choose their battles. Again, that makes total sense. But mechanically, I can do all this stuff for one move, or I can do kill one monster for one move. That just doesn't line up. It's too big of a gap. So, again, um, back to this being this tightly wound puzzle. Um, <clears throat> I feel my... The two sides of my brain at odds with one another uh, because mechanically and the puzzle side of my brain really enjoys figuring this stuff out. It is, it is very fun. So at the end of the day, this game is fun as hell. Uh, so I do really like this game. But I'm also at odds because I'm in this really cool fantasy world on this gorgeous map and, excuse my, th my voice, uh, you rarely have a chance to just breathe and indulge in it, take it in, go explore. It never sends you on a little side quest. Hey, take your time, you know, enjoy the countryside. Forget that. Um, so, that is, that is, I guess... A long way of saying my second con is just the theme and the mechanics are sometimes at odds. I just don't... This game is very much an equation. I could see this... It's very, this is very much a Euro game. You know, I, I understand this designer um, is heavily involved in Euro games, and it shows. So I guess it's just you don't see this amount of fantasy theme and this type of tightly wound mechanics and <clears throat> to wrap up that point and back to my stars not aligning sometimes because this is such a puzzle so mechanically driven these dice it's this is another weird thing because if you go on a little bit of a cold spell on rolling dice, or if for some reason you you roll some a couple of ones and then the monster rolls dual sixes and it just wipes out one of your characters, it just doesn't make any sense uh, for, again, the, um, I don't know, just the analysis that is required by this game but then all of that analysis and number crunching and just gets wiped out by chance and this is coming from somebody who loves rolling dice but <clears throat> rolling dice in a game that is this puzzly is strange at times uh, but 
again, it is fun. It's fun. It's punishing. It's brutal. It doesn't necessarily care if you lose unfairly, unfairly or fairly. That just happens in this pretty fierce world that's presented us. So, so that leads me into my final pro. So we're doing two pros and two cons tonight. Bringing back for full circle to the pro is somehow, some way, all these elements that don't seem like they would fit together do. Again, it, um, it sometimes makes for a frustrating experience, but <clears throat> I can't think of one time I was playing this game and I wasn't having a good time. There are times where I have said a few choice words. There are times, uh, just a couple of times where I may have, oops, actually re-roll a dice uh, <laughs> um, just to give myself a chance. But outside of those, those, little, those little instances, Legend of Andor is a, a very good game. I can understand why it's so highly regarded by most people and it's considered a, somewhat of a classic that will live on. And I'm, I'm excited to go back into some of these games I've missed. And, <clears throat> again, apologize for the voice. But I do think today, sometimes with all the new games coming out, and Kickstarter, and all the advertising, and all the social media that we, we are hit with, uh, fear of missing out, and we always see previews and reviews of the new games that come out frequently. So I really enjoy the opportunity um, to talk about some of the older games um, that I've missed. And I really do like, like seeing those from other content um, creators. I know Daniel Dungeon Dive and, and uh, Berndt and Colin and Michael at One Stop Co-op Shop, they frequently go back to older games. Uh, you know, so not to belabor this review, but that's really cool. So I, I, I love the chance to um, add to that conversation. I'm excited to see everybody else continue to do that as well. So I just wanted to throw that in there real quick. Let's not forget about some of these classics like Legends of Andor. Let's not let all the new hype um, bury, you know, some of these old classics. So make sure that they're not forgotten and that other people you know, remember, or new gamers that are just entering the hobby, you know, they know of some of these classics too. Uh, so anyways, so I'm going to continue doing that. Uh, next game I talk about, this is a very much of a newer game. Escape the Dark Castle, I think is next on the list. So um, thank you guys for listening and watching. And I'm really interested in knowing what you guys think about this. And it's, it's, again, it's fun to talk about really play some of these games for the first time that many of you have already played and i'm going into this kind of blind creating my own thoughts and feelings about this game or these games putting it out there and i'm really interested in seeing do they align with much of what you guys think or are they totally off base in a completely different direction so We'll leave it at that. We'll see you next time for Escape the Dark Castle.